hello and welcome class to part two of our chapter three lecture in this whole series where today's lecture really builds off of part one. In part one, we talk about the wave properties that are going to be necessary in order to understand this next section of lecture. So if you already, uh, let's say, are up on wavelengths, frequency, and diffraction, specifically uh, wavelengths and frequency with their relationship to C, the speed of light, you will be fine. If you are literally in my class and also just watched part one either a couple of days ago or refreshed just before watching this, you're also going to be fine. Just want to make sure if there are any strangers kind of like wandering into this lecture, you are aware that you need to have an understanding of the basics of the wave properties before watching this lecture. All right, so what we are going to start getting into now is the quantum, the very small and the very weird. The studies of the quantum that we are going to be talking about, in addition to wave-particle duality, again, have to do with the wave-like nature of light and also matter, as well as the particle-like nature of matter as well as light. So we're going to start crossing those streams a little bit. We're going to start bridging the gap between what it means to be matter and what it means to be energy. This is fundamental to understand how energy and matter interact with each other through processes like absorption, emission, etc. And knowing that is essential for understanding how the electron functions as a thing. So let's start talking about the quantum. What is the quantum? Okay, so in, in order to understand the quantum, we first must understand what was being studied that led to the discovery of the quantum. So what was being studied was something called black body radiation. The proposal, or rather observation, that an object that has a temperature above 0K just gives off electromagnetic radiation either in the form of light or heat or whatever, but it needs to give off some form of electromagnetic radiation. We as people are a really great example uh, of black body radiation in action. We as people, again, existing above zero K, right? We're all hot blooded creatures, give off thermal energy. We give off a heat signature. And as we just talked about in part one, heat, is equal to infrared light. So in this photograph, which is a family portrait taken with a thermal camera, literally what the piece of technology did was capture the infrared light that was being given off and then translated it into visible light. So anywhere that's like white or yellow, there is a lot of heat. There is a higher intensity of infrared light. And anywhere that's more blue, uh, has a lesser intensity of infrared light. It's a cooler section. But everywhere in this picture where there is a person, there is infrared light being given off. We function as what is in physics known as a black body. Now, classical physics assumed that the radiation that is given off by a black body is constant. So in other words, classical physics, which is kind of synonymous with Newtonian, physics stated that the light given off by a particular person or a black body is continuous. It is one straight line or curvy line. It is one connected line. It behaves as a function, right? F of X, where F is the wave-like nature of the light. X describes some type of variable that it's dependent on, but it would be what we say in math is a continuous function. However, as black bodies were being studied, particularly the radiation that they were giving off was being studied, what we found was that the reality of this uh, like radiation of energy was so much weirder than what classical physics predicted. What Max Planck discovered in 1900, the turn of the century, was that the energy given off by a black body was not continuous. It was not a perfect f of x. Instead, what he found was that the energy is what he referred to as quantized. 
the energy was not by a person given off in one steady stream, but rather was given off in little pockets. In physics, we call these, uh, in like more modern language, wave packets. They're little sections of light that are being given off. And the energy that he was observing being given off by these black bodies were uh, all proportional to a particular constant that we call Planck's constant. This is the smallest quantity of energy that can be absorbed or emitted. Regardless of the frequency of light, if we factor out the frequency, in other words, measure the energy of the light, determine the frequency of the light, divide one by the other, we always find Planck's constant. It is always proportional to this constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joule seconds. Now, because the frequency of light, which we can see here, represented again by our Greek letter nu, is proportional uh, or inversely proportional to the wavelength, but proportional to the speed of light, we can rearrange this equation to solve for frequency and then insert that into the equation as well. Uh, so whether or not we are paying attention to light as a function of frequency or as a function of wavelength, both of these uh, equations can be set equal to energy if we multiply by Planck's constant, always. Right, so it's kind of strange to think about. We commonly, right, it's kind of easy for us to say, okay, well, matter is quantized. Matter comes in definite particles. The subatomic particles we've already talked about. You can break matter down to protons, neutrons, and electrons. And if you want to be really technical, you can break it down to quarks past that. But you can't really go any further without destroying the matter. The same thing goes, as it turns out, for energy. Energy also comes in discrete units, little pockets of energy, all proportional to Planck's constant. So the unit, or I should say the discrete unit, that little packet of energy is very, very small, right? 10 to the negative 34 is an incredibly tiny number. Also makes sense, subatomic particles have very, very tiny masses. So anytime we are talking about subatomic particles and energy and how they interact, we're going to have to start paying attention to quantum physics. Not This is not continuous physics. This is non-Newtonian physics. This is totally new, discontinuous, strange physics. All right, so let's see uh, the equation presented on the previous slide with Planck's constant in action. So beta carotene is inside of carrots. It's what gives the carrot that signature orange color. This uh, particular compound absorbs light at 450 nanometers and 470 nanometers. Now, both of these wavelengths of light, if we observe the electromagnetic spectrum, are kind of blue slash purple in appearance, which since this is the wavelength of light being absorbed, the opposite on the uh, color wheel or the complementary color is going to be what we see, which quite visibly is orange. That's exactly the color of carrots. So everything so far making sense. Let's pick out one of these wavelengths. Let's focus on the 450 nanometer light. The question is, how much does one photon, one particle of light that has a wavelength of 450 nanometers uh, have in joules? How much energy is there? In addition, we can ask the follow-up question, instead of just one photon, what if we had one mole of photons? How much energy is present there? All right, well, the equation that you're going to need is going to be the previous equation that we learned. E is equal to h nu, also equal to hc divided by lambda. And aside from watching the units, I'm just gonna let you guys try and work through this problem. How much energy does one photon of 450 nanometer light have? How about one mole of those photons? All right, welcome back from the pause. Where we're going to start solving this problem together, at least what I'm going to demonstrate. First, we're going to pay attention to the units. Pay attention to units, right? We have nanometers here, there's joules, there's moles. We want to make sure that all of the units that are currently presented to us are all going to actually be playing together in the equation that we're going to be working with. All right. Two, 
we are going to plug and chug. Pretty common phrase. We should have all of the pieces of information that we have. We're going to plug them into the equation. Again, paying attention to the units, making sure everything that we don't want cancels out and everything that we do want will remain. All right, so first we're paying attention to the units. In the equation that we are working with, first we need to pick out which portion we need. Do we have a frequency or do we have a wavelength? Well, looking at the wording of the problem, we're specifically told that we have a lambda equals. There is a wavelength here. Units are present in distance, which means again, we are paying attention to wavelengths. So that means that we're going to need the E is equal to HC divided by lambda version of this equation. E is equal to HC divided by lambda. All right, so speed of light, we know, again, Part one, we're gonna pay attention to the units. Speed of light, we are told in meters per second. We can use the same speed of light that we saw in part one of this lecture. Planck's constant, we just saw, is in unit of joule seconds. So we can see already that the two seconds are going to play together, they're gonna to cancel out, so we don't have to do anything with these constants. The wavelength that we are told is in nanometers. Here now we can see that there's a little bit of a discrepancy, right? Speed of light is in meters and the wavelength is in nanometers. So even before we take the values that we are given, these two different constants, H and C, we're gonna have to convert our wavelength into meters. That way it will actually properly cancel out when working with our speed of light. All right, so the wavelength that we are working with specifically is the uh, 450 nanometer wavelength. And this 450 nanometer wavelength light, we're gonna to have to convert into meters. Well, the metric prefix of the nano means that there are 1 billion or 10 to the nine nanometers in that one meter, right? Nano just means 1 billion. The way that I personally remember which prefix nano means, like what nano means, is that nano starts with an N. And the number nine, which is in the exponent here, also starts with an N, right? So nano means that you have 10 to the nine of whatever unit it is that you're working with. In this case, it just happens to be meters. So hopefully that's a little uh, mnemonic that is useful for other people as well. All right, so if we take 450 divided by 10 to the nine, our nanometers here canceling out, we are going to be left with a distance that is equal to 4.5 times 10 to the negative seven meters. I should say 4.50 if we're keeping with proper sig figs. Again, earlier I said I'm not a super, super huge stickler for sig figs and it's already starting to show. All right, so 4.50 times 10 to the negative seven meters. Now we can see our unit of meter is present. So this is going to be what we can insert into our equation. Now we have a wavelength in meters. I am going to clean the slide just so I have more room to write. So if you're still writing this stuff down, pause the video quick. I'm going to erase. All right, rewriting the equation that we need, E is equal to HC divided by lambda. And now we can actually start plugging and chugging. We can take our constant H, which is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. Our speed of light is 2.998 times 10 to the eight meters per second. And our wavelength, which we just calculated, is 4.50 times 10 to the negative seven meters. So the seconds in the numerator are going to cancel out since we're taking a second in the numerator and multiplying it by an inverse second, gonna cancel out. We have a meter in the numerator and a meter also in the denominator. Those are gonna cancel out. And so the only unit that remains we can see will be the joule. So this is great. This is going to give us a calculation straightforwardly for what the uh, energy of a single photon of this one particular wavelength is gonna be. So the unit of energy that one single photon of 450 nanometer light has is 4.5 for one times 10 to the negative 19 joules. So we can already just off the bat see that this is a very, very tiny unit of energy. And 
The number is so small that you might, again, be kind of tripped up at first. If you're critically evaluating your answer, you're like, oh, this seems too small. Like, this can't be right. Remember, this is the energy of one single photon. One teeny tiny little photon. We are on the quantum scale where masses are very small, energies are also going to be very small. So this actually, in its very small magnitude, makes perfect sense. Something on the value of, or on the magnitude of uh, 10 to the negative 19 is perfectly acceptable for the amount of energy that a single tiny particle is going to have. All right, but what if we had something that was more macroscopic? What if we had one mole of photons? So not one single photon, but instead a mole of photons. Well, in order to scale up this value, what we need to recognize is that just like before, when we first introduced the mole, one mole is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of whatever. In this case, we're going to be looking at photons. Before, we looked at atoms and molecules, but again, a mole is just 6.022 uh, times 10 to the 23 of whatever. So if one photon has 4.41 times 10 to the negative 19 joules of energy, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd photons is going to have that much more energy. We're going to scale the whole thing up. How this looks with dimensional analysis is going to hopefully make my description a little bit more clear. So we're going to start with our 4.41 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. And again, this is per photon. We're going to multiply this by Avogadro's number, where there are 6.022 times 10 to the 23. In this case, we are working with photons. And this is all per every one mole. So if one photon had 4.41 times 10 to the negative 19 joules of energy, and now we're scaling it up by Avogadro's number worth of photons, all we have to do is similarly scale up the energy. So we're going to take the unit of energy we just found, multiply it by Avogadro's number, and this is going to give us a value of energy that is 2. 6 times 10, 10, to the 5 joules per every mole. Now this is a unit of energy that is much more appreciable on the macroscopic scale. This is a unit of energy um, that we would be able to like feel as thermal energy or we would be able to see as visible light. All right, so we have the quantum. The question still remained of how does light and matter interact with each other. That's what we're kind of working our way towards. Now, Einstein was a physicist working in 1905. I'm sure you've heard of him. In 1905 specifically, he published a paper on what he called the photoelectric effect. Um, most people assume, because Einstein's the most famous for like his theory of general relativity and working with gravity and all of that kind of stuff, most people assume that that's what he won his Nobel Prize for. That's actually not true. He won his Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect. So let's talk about what he observed and what he concluded. Now, what he observed and what was being observed also by other physicists at the time was that electrons, which we've talked about, those very tiny particles that by the time he was working had just been uh, discovered, you know, like a dozen or so years ago in like 1897. So, the electron being just discovered, now again, people were trying to, now that we knew of the electron, find it and use it to try and understand the very, very tiny, the subatomic. So electrons were found to be ejected from metal surfaces when they were exposed to light. So you would shine a flashlight on a metal surface, whatever type of metal was being used, and all depending on the frequency, there, frequency of light being used, Sometimes electrons were jettisoned off of the uh, like metal surface, and sometimes they weren't. It didn't have to do with how intense the light was, rather it had to do with the frequency of light, the color of the light. And so in this kind of diagram down below, we can see that red light was being shown on this metal surface, nothing was being kicked off, 
the frequency was increased to green light, and we can see now that there are a couple of uh, electrons being pushed off. And as we increase the frequency even more to blue light, electrons were being kicked off much faster. So there were more electrons more quickly being kicked off of this metal surface. Einstein reasoned, and I'm phrasing this in the most like rudimentary way, so if you've studied more advanced physics, like again, please give me a pass, this is for general chemistry. The conclusion he came to was that light, which was being shown onto this metal surface, had to be made of some type of particle. It had to be made of what he called a photon. In order for light to interact with matter, it also must have some matter-like behavior to it. Specifically, we can think, uh, in other words, of like, um, you know, pool. That's the most, <laughs> or billiards, I guess, if you want to be like technical. If there's some type of pool ball being shot at a surface, then it would make sense that it's going to transfer some of its energy to another ball sitting here, which will become ejected. Now, again, the frequency, aka the energy, of the incoming ball needs to be just right in order to actually cause this second collision to like move. It needs to actually, you know, collide with sufficient energy to get something to move. But that's exactly what Einstein found was that all depending on what energy signature or frequency the light had, certain electrons would be kicked off or they would be kicked off faster with higher frequency light. And so he reasoned that light actually had to be made of this particle he called a photon. All right, so this discovery is what won him the Nobel Prize, this matter-like behavior, this particle-like behavior of light, which up until this point had only been really considered to be like a continuous wave. So Einstein built off of Max Planck's results, further solidifying our quantum understanding of the behavior of light. When you get really, really small, light tends to behave differently than when we normally look at it at the like macroscopic scale. We call this wave-particle duality. The notion that photons can behave both as classical waves and as particles. And they do this simultaneously. If we design an experiment to, des uh, to um, observe light as a wave, like on the macro our macroscopic scale, like how Newton had done it, we're just gonna see light as a classical wave with a really nice smooth wavelength that's going to behave uh, very predictably. It's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Conversely, if you set up an experiment to observe waves behaving in these little packets, like how Planck had seen, like how Einstein had started to see, then you're going to observe light behaving as a particle. The problem is that light behaves as both at the same time. We just don't really have any really good experiments to observe both the classical on the macroscopic scale and the, uh, like the particle-like behavior on the quantum scale at the same time, because the scales are so different. So one really famous experiment set up that sort of demonstrates this binary, or like at least seemingly binary behavior is known as the double slit experiment. So on the left, we have set up more of a classical observable approach. So we are letting light, uh, which this is our light source right here. We are letting light pass out of this light source. We can see it's got uh, these like, you know, waves that are passing to these two slits. And if we do not observe the slits, but rather observe the uh, like detective board on the other side, which we can see here, this is where we are observing. What we see is a classic diffraction pattern. So again, thinking back to part one, as a wave passes through a slit, it will diffract. And if we have light passing through multiple points, the light will then curve and interact with itself constructively and deconstructively. And that is what we end up seeing on uh, this like wall on the back. We have this constructive alternating with the, I'm actually write this up here, deconstructive. However, if we change the experiment, if instead of strictly observing the backboard, if we also pay attention to where the light is moving through 
the uh, slits. So if now we're paying attention here, if this is what we are watching. And I say, I use watching in a very like loose sense. What I really mean is if we're detecting, if we're paying attention and if we've set up sensors in this location, what we actually end up seeing in the second example is more of the quantum behavior of light. And literally the diffraction pattern on the back wall changes. It's kind of nuts. It's almost like, again, the behavior of this wave being both classical and quantum is simultaneous, but all depending on where we're looking, we cause this simultaneous behavior to break down and suddenly the light has to choose, do I behave as a classical wave or do I behave as a particle on the quantum scale? Because if we observe the slits in this right-hand illustration, what ends up happening is that, as we can also see in kind of the illustration, the uh, light be uh, begins to behave strictly as a particle. And that's exactly because of how the experiment is set up. We're trying to count particles as they move through the slits. The behavior of the light collapses into one strict set of behaviors, and suddenly because it's behaving now as a particle, because we're trying to count particles, on the backboard we do not see, there is no uh, interference pattern, but instead it's sort of like a splatter pattern, where we can almost think of it in terms of like, if you were a person standing over here with a paintball gun and shooting at the wall. So this is my like crude little paintball gun and we're shooting at this wall. There's only going to be a splatter pattern on the back wall where there were slits in the front, right? All of the rest of the paintballs would just get stuck on the walls up here. So if we're paying attention to the light and expecting it to behave as a wave in this first example, we see it behaving as a classical wave, projecting an interference pattern. If we expect as is illustrated on the right, for these, uh, like, for the wave, for the light to interact as a particle, we see no interference pattern, and it suddenly starts behaving strictly as a particle on the quantum scale. The results, again, are sort of mind-boggling, all depending on where you're looking. You can cause light to collapse into either acting as a strict wave or a strict particle, even though if we're not paying attention at all, it's doing both at the same time. If we could design an experiment that could track both the classic and the quantum, we would actually be able to see both of these behaviors simultaneously at once, right? That's what simultaneous means, being a little redundant. But we currently don't have that technology to be able to do both at once. And so light almost has to be forced into this binary behavior just because of how we're looking at it. And as it turns out, matter does the same thing. So there is also a wave-particle duality nature to matter as well. So objects with a mass also can behave as classical particles and waves simultaneously. So here's a really important distinction to make. Photons, which had been discovered again by Einstein, photons are not matter. And the reason why is they are massless. And on day one of the class, we talked about the importance of our definition of matter. In order for something to be matter, it has to have mass and it has to occupy space. Photons don't have mass and therefore they are not matter. They're just particles of energy. However, wave particle duality has found that objects with mass, so things that are matter, can also behave as energy or waves. For example, in the illustration on the right, what is being shown is that beta rays, which now we have discussed are actually comprised of electrons, are being shot through a double slit. And as time passes, so like A is like time point equal to one, we see that there's not a ton of electrons being present here. As time is allowed to build up, so B is time equal to two, time equal to three, all the way until we get to E, which was the last time point, if the slits of the double slit were not being observed, what we actually see is that the electrons begin to form an interference, that is interference, I think I just made it worse, interference pattern. So matter can behave 
as a wave does. The only way we would have gotten this type of alternating constructive and deconstructive interference pattern is if the beta ray was deconstructing with itself as light can. So when we get to the very small, the quantum scale, the very, very tiny, and we're only paying attention to like one photon at a time or one electron at a time, we can start to observe energy behaving as matter would and matter behaving as energy does. And in 1924, scientists by the name of Luis de Broglie put this observation into math. He derived an equation, which we can see here down below. How he did this was he used the known wavelength of photons um, in conjunction with one of Einstein's, I mean, like probably his most famous equation, E is equal to mc squared, which states that the energy of a piece of matter is equal to its mass times the speed of light squared. So we're looking at matter here on the left. And uh, energy also has been found to be equal to h times c, all divided by lambda. This is what we talked about earlier. This is light or energy. If matter can behave as energy, and if energy in the form of light, right, can behave as matter, well, surely these two equations can be put together and give us something in for, or give us uh, some information that is useful. If we rearrange the two right-hand pieces of the equation and solve for lambda, what we find is exactly the de Broglie wavelength equation down below. We can use it to predict the wavelength of objects that have mass where the mass that goes into this equation right here has to be present in kilograms. And the velocity, since technically matter can't move at the speed of light, we swap out C for V, the velocity is also going to be in meters per second. Planck's constant is that same Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. But if we have the mass and the velocity of an object, we can use that to predict exactly what wavelength of light it would have if it were to start showcasing its wave-like behavior. Now, the awesome thing about this equation is that it works not just on the quantum scale, but on the macroscopic scale as well. So we can actually predict the wavelength for things like basketballs, um, baseballs, cars, or even people. If you have mass and you're moving at a certain velocity, you also have a wave-like character to you. It just so happens that your wave-like character is sort of a nonsensical number. It is something that is right so absurdly small that it doesn't actually functionally exist. But you do have a wave-like character to you. And if we could either uh, like decrease your mass or really uh, like you know, alter your velocity, we could get you to start behaving more like a quantum particle and we could get your wave to actually mean something as a functional wave on the electromagnetic spectrum. All right, so let's look at this equation in action. This seemingly nonsensical notion of wave-particle duality we can actually put into numbers and make some predictions about the world around us. So let's calculate the de Broglie wavelength. So anytime you see de Broglie wavelength, what this tells you is that you're going to be using the equation uh, lambda is equal to h divided by mv. You are not going to be working with c is equal to lambda uh, nu. So we're not going to be working with this equation. We're not working with a wavelength of pure energy. We're working with a de Broglie wavelength of something that has mass. So that's our first clue as to what type of equation we're working with, since a lot of the variables now are kind of, uh, you know, popping up in repeated equations. All right, so returning to the problem, what is the de Broglie wavelength of an electron that's moving at half the speed of light? Now it's not uncommon to think or observe uh, or think of or observe electrons moving at such high speeds, right? They're not at the speed of light, but because they're super tiny, we can actually accelerate them up to half the speed of light pretty easily. So if we did that, what would the wavelength nature of that particle be? All right, so I'm going to give you guys, again, as always, the chance to work through this problem yourself, and then we will work through this problem together. All right, let's come back together. Let's 
solve this last problem of the day. So our wavelength is equal to h divided by mass times velocity. Now in the wording of the problem, we are actually told what the mass of the electron is right here, 9.109 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. And we are also reminded as to what the speed of light is, since we are told the electron is moving at half that speed. All right, so let's start taking our numbers and plugging them in to where we need them to go. The wavelength is equal to our Planck's constant, the 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joule seconds. And we are dividing this by mass. And again, we were told previously that the mass has to be in kilograms. We'll see why in a split second. So, uh, so we're going to insert that down below. 9.109 times 10 to the negative 31 kilograms. That's a G, kilograms. And we are multiplying this by the velocity of the particle. So half the speed of light. Now I could calculate what half of C is, but literally what I'm going to do is just write one half of 2.998, I'll even write this as a little times to make it really clear. One half of 2.998 times 10 to the eight meters per second. All right, so now we have one cohesive equation and we are going to crunch the number and find a wavelength on the other side. Now let's pay attention to our units, right? Again, what's a number without a unit? In the numerator, we can see that we have seconds and in the denominator, we have inverse seconds. Well, seconds doesn't really cancel out inverse seconds if it's in the uh, denominator. They actually multiply together, they scale together. And there's nothing in the numerator that cancels out our meters and there's nothing that cancels out our kilograms. So like, are the units actually paying, like working together here? The answer is actually yes. So remember that one joule, is equal to one kilogram meter squared per second squared. So as the units in this problem are apparently not working together, if we translate the joule into the kilogram meter squared per second squared, we can actually see how the units are going to be working together much in a much more like straightforward way. All right, so let's insert this kilogram times meter squared per second squared into uh, a rewritten version of this equation. And in fact, just to clean it up a little bit, I'm gonna crunch the number as well. So the number is gonna be condensed. We'll take our 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 and divide it by everything here in the denominator. This gives us a number of 4.852 times 10 to the negative 12. And now we have to figure out what the unit is on this number. Ideally, it's going to be some type of distance unit, but let's make sure. So we're going to substitute the kilogram meter squared per second squared for this joule here. Kilogram meter squared per second squared. And this is all times the second, since that is also present right here. In the denominator, we have a kilogram present, so we're gonna divide this by the kilogram. We also have a meter. And what I'm gonna do with the seconds right here, what we're literally doing with this unit is we are taking the inverse, since it's in the denominator, of an inverse, since it's one over the second. An inverse of an inverse actually moves the object into the numerator. So we can see we actually have two seconds uh, multiplied together in the numerator right here. So I've taken the inverse of the inverse of this second, since it's in the denominator of a denominator, and I'm just moving it up to the numerator because that's technically where it belongs. Once it's in the numerator, it becomes way more obvious that the seconds here are gonna cancel out since we have a second squared, dividing that by a second squared present right next door. We have a kilogram divided by a kilogram, and we have a meter squared divided by a single meter. So we're gonna cancel out the squared, cancel out one of the meters in the denominator, and that leaves us with one man standing, one unit of the meter. So this tells us that the wavelength of an electron moving at half the speed of light is 4.852 times 10 to the negative 12 meters. Now that's fine, but let's give this value 
even more context. Let's give this value some meaning. Is this value of a wavelength actually on the electromagnetic spectrum anywhere, or is it a nonsense number? A way to be able to tell what this uh, like wavelength of light is, is to compare it to like an electromagnetic spectrum that has some type of like measured quantities on it. So let's actually go back to our electromagnetic spectrum from earlier in the part one of this lecture. On this scale, we can see that there are some kind of rough cutoffs for where each of the wavelengths of energy are. Now the large wavelengths we can see present in the unit of the meter, but the very small wavelengths, which is what we're working with, are present in the unit of the nanometer. So let's convert the uh, wavelength that we just found into nanometers. This is gonna give us a better idea of if it actually fits on the left-hand side of the spectrum or not. All right, so our wavelength of 4.852 times 10 to the negative 12 meters, we're gonna convert this into nanometers. And as I said earlier, we can remember what the exponent uh, for our like, conversion of the nanometer is. Since nanometer starts with an N, we know that the conversion is gonna be 10 to the nine, since nine also starts with an N. And there are that many nanometers per every one single meter. All right, in crunching then this number, meters are gonna cancel out, leaving us with only the nanometers left over as a unit. We're gonna take our number on the left and multiply it by 10 to the nine. If we do this, we get a number that is 0 0.004852 nanometers. So we're looking at uh, four thousandths of a nanometer. So now that we have the wavelength, allegedly, right, our de Broglie wavelength for an electron moving at half the speed of light, as previously stated, we can now return to the uh, electromagnetic spectrum here and uh, since we were trying to find something on the scale of the nanometer, where we can see that each of these tick marks is approximately like a factor of 100, um, our value was around four thousandths of a nanometer. And so by kind of predicting where the next tick mark would be, uh, it would appear as though we're going to be somewhere, right, and this is all kind of qualitative, uh, where the tick mark, the cutoff here is around one one hundredth of a nanometer. Our wavelength of light is somewhere around four thousandths of a nanometer, but we are functionally going to be somewhere in the gamma ray zone. So wherever it specifically is on the chart here doesn't quite matter. What's important is that we have found that the magnitude of the wavelength matches somewhere on the electromagnetic spectrum in like a real appreciable way. So if we were to observe this electron moving at half the speed of light, we would see it functionally behaving as a gamma ray, not necessarily just as an electron. It also is a gamma ray right now. All right, so we can, again, also calculate to Broglie wavelengths for things on the macroscopic scale. There's actually gonna be a couple of homework problems around this, so you can kind of compare the different uh, magnitudes of the wavelengths and see kind of how nonsensical de Broglie wavelengths get on the macroscopic scale. But for now, we are going to call it a day. We are going to call that a lecture. So here we have some example problems uh, pertaining to quantum theory, which is going to be our E is equal to H nu and or equal to H times C all divided by lambda. And the wave properties of matter, uh, so if you want some more example problems pertaining to the de Broglie wavelength equation, which is our lambda is equal to h divided by mass times velocity, you can get some uh, additional practice in there, where, again, to reiterate, these problems are never due, just for practice, so if you feel comfortable with both, you don't have to do any of them, but if you want some extra practice, this is a really good place to start. All right, if you have homework, do your homework. And otherwise, class is dismissed. <laughs>